climate is a very complicated subject that thousands of scientists from many different fields are studying. We have people looking at the modern atmosphere, people looking at the modern ocean, people looking at the modern water cycle on land, as well as people studying historical and um, what we call paleoclimate or paleoceanography records in lakes, oceans, and ice cores as well. And these studies of ancient climates are of critical importance because they help establish the basic boundary conditions of the natural system so we can understand better how much what's going on today actually deviates from natural cycles because it most assuredly does and we need to understand why. There are people who are focusing on the physics of the system, people focusing on the chemistry or the biology, all of which can be recorded in the geology, that is the marine sediment or the ice cores on the planet Earth. Physics is important because the atmosphere and the ocean circulate and they exchange gas, carbon dioxide, so that involves chemistry. And biology is involved primarily through photosynthesis, which is the process by which plants, including plants in the ocean, take atmospheric carbon dioxide and turn it into oxygen, just like the green lawn in your house or, or plants or what have you. The ocean circulates, that's physics, and that's also driving the exchange of carbon dioxide between the atmosphere and the ocean. In essence, my job involves looking at mud. And there are times I can't believe that that's essentially what I do, is I look at mud. And what we all call mud is actually what we call marine sediment. And marine sediment is a very complicated mixture of basically everything that is happening in the ocean and in the atmosphere at any one point in time. There's atmospheric dust that's being blown around that's called aeolian input, named after the Greek god of the wind, Aeolus. And that consists of essentially dirt from land, very, very fine-grained, millionths of a meter in size, uh, being blown out into the ocean and, and deposited there. There's also microscopic plankton that float in the ocean, and when they die or they get eaten, their body parts and their organic matter falls down to the seafloor and lands there as well. There's also direct organic matter, which is not just fish remains and things like that, but it's morally organic carbon associated with those plankton. There's also minerals that grow on or in the seafloor over millions of years of time. So the sediment itself that looks just like mud is very complicated mixture of geological materials, biological materials, and chemical materials as well. And what we study when we look at these cores is we look at, for example, the abundance of plankton at one time or another in Earth history, or the abundance of those wind-blown aeolian deposits at other times. And we look to see if, say, for example, during windier times on Earth, which might be recorded by grains of a larger grain size, minerals of a larger grain size, or if the earth is wetter, we might have mi different mineral compositions. And we see how or if those changes in the mineral structure or the um, aeolian material, does that correlate with changes in the biology of the system? So we can really look at the linkages, the biogeochemistry of the system, trying to link atmospheric processes to ocean processes to geological processes. And what's wonderful about marine sediment is if we go to some areas where the sedimentation rate is very slow, that is the sediments piling up on the seafloor very slowly, as in maybe a millimeter every thousand years, with one core of maybe 10, 20, 30, or 40 meters, we can look way back into geological time, millions of years back into geological time, and by examining the fine-grained layers, we can study these different processes. On the other hand, if we go to areas where the sedimentation rate is fast, on the order of maybe a centimeter a year, something like that, then we can look at very highly resolved, very fine, rapid changes in Earth's climate system 
uh, over the last couple thousand years. So depending on what we're looking for and depending on what, where we are on the planet, are we down near Antarctica, are we near the equator, are we out in the middle of the open ocean, and looking at places with different sedimentation rates, we can use the marine sediment as a tape recorder of ocean and atmospheric history. So there's a lot of different aspects to studying climate, and their complexities are what make it such a challenge for us to understand. But just like the human body is very complicated, we understand quite a lot about the human body, but there are some things we don't understand. And so we're pursuing other ways of, other means of looking at climate as well. Some of the work I've been doing recently, for example, focuses on the Asian monsoon system, which stretches from essentially northern China and Japan all the way down through um, Southeast Asia, Indonesia, and into India. And collectively, the Asian monsoon system, which most people think of as high rainfall time periods uh, during, a, during a year yearly cycle, but the Asian monsoon delivers water to over half of the world's population. The East Asian monsoon, which is the focus of an oceanographic research cruise that I participated on and helped lead last year, feeds about a third of the world. And there what we're studying is we're studying how changes in the jet stream coming across Asia may move north or move south as a function of climate. So perhaps during glacial time periods or non-glacial time periods, the jet stream may be more northerly or more southerly or more strong or more weak. And in all those scenarios, it delivers different amounts of water to uh, Asia, to China and Japan in particular. So understanding the natural behavior of that Asian monsoon system over the last millions of years, as well as the last thousand years, really helps us understand what's going on now. And although my own work doesn't do this, it will help us predict the future, or at least put some constraints on what the future will hold as our Earth continues to warm. The monsoon is a good example of the physics of the system, how atmospheric circulation will uh, move north or south across Asia and deliver different amounts of dust to the ocean. And we can then look at the records of that dust to help us figure out the position of that jet stream that I just spoke about. Another aspect over different time scales that people are looking at involves the biology. Sometimes that dust that blows out into the ocean, for example, part of it will dissolve in the surface ocean and release iron. Iron, as you know, is a nutrient. We need it. All life forms need iron. The addition of iron into the surface ocean is likely to stimulate biological productivity. That is, you add iron to the system and the plant plankton grow. How much more they grow remains to be determined. People are studying this. And the long-term effect of adding iron naturally into the ocean uh, is also being studied. Some of the work I've done with colleagues over time periods of a million years in the open ocean equatorial Pacific pretty clearly shows that the addition of natural iron will cause um, biological plankton specifically diatoms, which are made of silica, to um, grow more and perhaps sink more and be deposited on the seafloor more. So we've established a relationship between the addition of iron into the system and more biological productivity. And that's interesting because it's thought that during glacial time periods when the earth is drier, there's more dust being blown around in the atmosphere and if there's more dust being blown around in the atmosphere, there's more iron being released into the surface ocean when that dust lands in, the, lands in that ocean. And then when there's more iron, then you have more biological productivity. And with more biological productivity, you might draw down atmospheric CO2 a little bit, which makes the Earth a little colder, kind of an inverse global warming. So we've seen that in the natural system, if you add iron or some other nutrients, you have the potential to change the concentration of atmospheric carbon dioxide, which is, of course, related to global temperatures. Some people have suggested that perhaps mankind should add, should 
synthetically add iron into the surface ocean as a way to combat global warming. And we're nowhere near understanding the system enough to engage in manipulation of Earth's natural system to that extent. It's very premature to think of that because it's a very, very complicated system and we might end up causing more inadvertent harm than we're trying to solve. Obtaining the cores themselves from the deep ocean floor is a very challenging engineering task. And there are many brilliant engineers who have come up with very creative ways to retrieve this material from the seafloor and haul it back up onto the ship where we're able to study it. On the research ships themselves, we do a lot of measurements that are um, of parameters that are transitory that will decay away very rapidly unless we do them immediately. For example, some people, and this is some of the work that I do, we look at the pore water, that is the water that's contained between the grains of the sediment, because the chemistry of that water tells us a lot about the nature of that core material and in some ways what the temperature was at the time that that material was deposited, the temperature of the ocean water. Other things that we, other scientists do is we look at the color of each individual layer of the core because as it turns out color can be measured at very very small intervals and um, the color will correspond to the different types of the minerals that are deposited or made up in that sediment. Once we're on shore, um, the cores are taken to a repository where they're stored for decades, in, in essence, in perpetuity. There are cores at academic institutions and national government repositories all over the world that have been gathered 50, 60, even 70 years ago, and these core materials are very, very valuable, and people still work on them. I've got samples in my lab of cores that were taken from before I was born that we're studying and still learning um, new information from. People work on the chemistry, they work on the mineralogy, they work on virtually every aspect you can to get a complete understanding of the different processes that resulted in that material being deposited and then correlating that through time so we can look at changes in Earth history. Because climate is a global phenomenon, it's being studied by scientists from many nations, virtually all nations, around this planet of ours. Uh, when I go to sea on oceanographic research cruises, uh, every single trip consists of an incredible diverse array of international uh, participants. Uh, on my last trip, for example, we had people from China, Korea, Japan, Germany, Italy, England, the U.S., New Zealand, Australia, and may have forgotten a country or two for which I, for which I apologize. I'm leaving next week uh, on another research trip with a completely different uh, set of scientists, people from the United States, uh, Germany, uh, Japan, uh, Canada, and England. Uh, so people all over the world are interested in this, and it's very interesting to me, because I've been doing this since I was a graduate student, to learn the different perspectives, because different countries do science in very different ways. Some countries are more top-down, management-driven. Some countries, like the U.S., are more uh, grassroots, bubble up, let the individual scientists drive the agenda. But it takes all these different approaches to uh, address the complexities of the system, and also, it takes the large government support to actually do this science. Because taking a ship out to sea is quite costly. Uh, studying the cores is quite costly. Keeping the cores around for several decades. So, for example, people 30 years from now will use analytical techniques that haven't even been invented yet to learn more about these cores and climate in the past. It's crucial. So. It takes a diverse group of scientists with their completely different cultural approaches to studying the science, and it takes a fair bit of financial support in order to do it as well. What I find most thrilling about the study of 
the old ocean or the old atmosphere as it's recorded in marine sediment is the simple fact that what we're looking at is how the complexities of this planet operate and how climate has varied to a certain degree and how the ocean has varied to a certain degree as part of the natural system. It's very clear in both theory, experiment, and observation that the Earth is warming. We don't understand all the processes behind it, but it's very, very clear the Earth is warming, and the vast consensus of scientists understand this. We also understand the basics of the system. Carbon dioxide, retention of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere retains heat, and so on and so forth, that um, people understand and uh, we're working with. Having said that, however, we don't understand everything about the system. And I think what's very exciting is some of the work that I'm doing and my colleagues are doing is putting very good boundaries on the complexities of the natural system. So we can figure out, back before we started adding carbon dioxide to the atmosphere at the great rate that we're doing now, how the natural system operated. If you want to understand how a system is changing, you have to understand what it is changing from. And those of us that study the natural system, which is only recorded in marine sediments and ice cores and records like that, we really have to understand um, how cold it could possibly get in the past, how warm it could possibly get in the past, what the rates of change were, how long lived these cold episodes were or warm episodes were, so we can better understand uh, the system we're in now and better understand what it may be for our children and grandchildren and beyond.